Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Another episode of On Finding Peace. And in this podcast, we talk about topics of mindfulness and helping you to find practical ways of living out an inner peace for yourselves. And today I'm very pleased to have a guest with us. And our guest today is author uh, John uh, Vespasian. And he is coming to us uh, all the way from Europe. So very pleased that uh, you are taking the time to do this for us. And we're going to be speaking on his new book. Uh, John has his eighth book out. And this book is called Thriving in Difficult Times, 12 Lessons from Ancient Greece to Improve Your Life Today. So thank you, John, for joining us. Uh, thanks to you, uh, Chris. It's a pleasure to uh, to be here. And uh, it's great to have you back. Uh, we talked uh, last time when you had your uh, seventh book out. And uh, so I, I'm very pleased to be speaking with you again and hearing you know a bit about what's different between the two. But um, can you tell us just a, a little bit of a quick summary on what is thriving in difficult times all about? Yes, uh, I have been uh, researching this book for a year uh, because uh, I'm fascinated about uh, ancient uh, Greek culture. I think uh, there are great lessons to be learned from the, from the stories, from the myths, from the legends of the ancient Greeks. And um, I have been um, uh, thinking about this book already for a long, for a very, very long time, maybe for a decade. So I actually took the time to do the research and to put the book together. And the idea is, um, the, the central idea of the book is to try to go through different uh, stories or different uh, episodes of uh, Greek history and authors and uh, philosophers and try to extract from all the stories uh, practical lessons that we can use uh, today in the 21st century. And why would you go back into ancient Greece? Uh I definitely get the idea of the history, uh, you know, and learning from our past. Um, and that was some of what we had talked about in your seventh book. Why uh, go all the way to the ancient Greeks? Or might I even say, why stop when you're going back with the ancient Greeks? Uh, because the ancient uh, Greek culture have particular characteristics that uh, made it very successful. So I think um, if we want to learn, if we want to improve, um, I think it's a good example to take because it was a culture uh, that produced uh, great works of art, uh, a good standard of living, uh, stability, and um, prosperity for 1,000 years. Now you have to realize that uh, there are very, very few uh, cultures in history that have um, actually thrived for 1,000 years and have been able to leave a huge heritage of language, of um, uh, legal and cultural um, achievements. And this is what makes uh, ancient Greek uh, culture so fascinating. Right. So, I, you know, what you're doing in your book that is taking some of the writings and philosophies and putting it into modern life, or are you just saying here is what, they've done, and then we can apply to what our situation is? Um, what I have done is to, to go through um, really dozens and dozens of, uh, of uh, historical um, episodes and um, ancient books and to try to draw only those um, lessons that are practical. Because the problem when you study history at school is that uh, mainly it is presented as a series of dates and a series of battles and kings and queens, and this makes it uh, very boring and very much uh, useless. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the purpose of the book is to go through really the essence of uh, Greek culture, ancient Greek culture, and to try to draw lessons that we can apply today in, in our time. 
And I, I really like how you mentioned that about the practical tips, because, you know, for me, history is a hobby. It's a fascination, but I didn't really enjoy it in school for the same reasons that you had mentioned, that it mainly was war to war and memorize some dates and then you got it without digging a little bit deeper into trying to figure out, well, what was going on at the time? What were the influencers, not just people, but situations, which allowed those settings to happen? So I, I think it's you know wonderful that you can draw from their history, but more of the practical side. Yes, uh, let me give you an example of uh, the kind of approach uh, I take in the book. One of the characteristics um, that you see in ancient Greece uh, compared to other cultures of the same uh, period, uh, like Mesopotamia or Egypt, is that uh, the ancient Greeks were extremely tolerant um, towards other peoples and even towards themselves. I mean, they, they were polytheistic uh, cultures. They have many, many different gods and many different uh, ideas about um, uh, divinity and about, um, um, I mean, how to, how to pray and the rituals. They were, there were a lot of uh, different ideas. But um, the Greeks were extremely tolerant um, when it came to, uh, to dealing with other peoples. And it made them extremely successful because it was extremely... Uh, unusual uh, in ancient times that people were able to trade with each other. I mean, the normal way of relating to other cultures was usually conquest, uh, slavery, and distraction. And the Greeks uh, are unique in this respect because they created uh, a very, um, really big uh, network of colonies in the Mediterranean. I mean, really dozens and dozens of colonies or trading posts to be able to trade with Egyptians, to be able to trade with Mesopotamians, to be able to trade uh, with, uh, with the Romans. And this is unique. They were very, very much uh, tolerant. And uh, you see in their cultures, for instance, um, their ability to deal with prejudice. And this is something that we really can learn today because you see very, very often today, I mean, you see, unfortunately, in the, in the daily news that people are still killing each other uh, because they don't have the same ideas. And this right. is something that uh, the Greeks very, very early in history that um, is very, very improductive and very, very, very much um, useless to try to force your ideas in other people. It's very much better to find the common ground so that you can actually trade with them, you can do business with them, and you can live together. And the variety and the tolerance you see in ancient uh, Greek society, it's something that we have, we have uh, a lot to learn from. I would definitely agree with that because when you do just a, a quick surface analysis of what was the Greek culture versus, say, later on the Roman Empire, to me, very basically, the Roman Empire was based off of the conquests and, and the slavery. and But when we look at the Greeks, they didn't worry about all of that, as you were mentioning. It, it's you know, more of those ideas and the trade and, you know, kind of working together instead of conquering. Are there any examples that you can find today in maybe a country or a territory that's similar to that? Or have we as a world kind of gone far astray from what our ancestors had? Well, um, unfortunately, the modern Greece is not a good example uh, because uh, you see people fighting on the streets um, almost uh, every day. Um, but you see the most successful countries today on earth, whether you're talking about Singapore, or you're talking about um, um, uh, Switzerland, where you have a very high standard of living, they're extremely tolerant. I mean, you have these countries where people speak uh, different languages, they have different religions, they have different uh, cultural values and different um, approaches uh, to live in. And they're able to live together uh, very successfully and to build uh, businesses and to build uh, prosperity. And this is something we have to learn from. We have to remind ourselves of the lessons from history. Mm -hmm. When you see, uh, for instance, how the ancient Greeks uh, dealt with, uh, with sickness, this is also very interesting because when, nowadays uh, when you go to a physician, 
um, normally you would get a diagnosis, you get a prescription, and the prescription will be very precise. You have to take uh, five milligrams of this on 10 milligrams of that. Uh, we have this approach, this almost mathematical approach uh, to sickness, which was completely unknown in ancient Greece. In ancient Greece, you have uh, very much a holistic uh, medicine. And when you read uh, Hippocrates, uh, who left uh, really a very, very large uh, number of writings, and you see how they actually dealt uh, with sickness, it's all very much uh, a holistic approach, very much tolerant and very much based on the individual. And this is why when you see the prescriptions uh, that Hippocrates uh, gave for different sickness, he, always, uh, he was always very prudent, always saying that you have to adapt the different treatments to the individual mm -hmm. and that you have to avoid radical treatments. Because uh, when, you take a, when you adopt, uh, for instance, a radical, very, very strict uh, diet, uh, you don't leave any margins for error. And he was uh, perfectly uh, conscious at that time that uh, the human being and the individual, uh, we are biological uh, beings and we are always changing. And this is why ancient uh, Greek medicine was very much focused on the, on the whole individual, trying to improve uh, the resistance to sickness and trying to improve um, uh, the general um, health of the body instead of treating a very specific sickness. Uh, and the, the approach they took uh, was not mathematical, was very much uh, holistic. Right. So we, I think, generally have gone so far, uh, you know, astray from that, that reading about the Greeks in a very different way sounds to be extremely beneficial to what we're doing now. And when you say you're looking at those practical tips, what might be a couple takeaways that, you know, some of the listeners can think about, well, you know, I'm going through whatever in my life and, you know, what could I personally learn from my ancient ancestors and take back with me and maybe try it? Well, one of the, the ideas that uh, I really underline in the book and I really present it uh, with different examples is the idea of uh, using your resources uh, wisely. And this is um, in these times where most people really have um, a good income and they, and they can afford uh, to buy many things. Uh, sometimes uh, people really don't uh, pay attention to this principle, but it's critical. And when you see the, the, um, the achievements of ancient Greece and you see the monuments and you see these temples and you see these sculptures, you have to realize that uh, all this was actually created by a very, very small number of people. I mean, ancient Athens uh, consisted of 300,000 people. I mean, it was really like a small town in the USA. And they created all this fantastic culture. Uh, how did they do it? How did they manage to do all that? Basically, by using their resources very, 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 very um, effectively. And you see this, for example, when, um, when the Persians tried to invade uh, ancient Greece. So basically, they tried to, to take over uh, Athens and Sparta. Mm -hmm. And they were just a couple of small towns uh, with, uh, I mean, when you take today's standards, we're just a few, a few hundred thousand people. And you saw the, the Persians, they came to Greece to take over the country. And they came with uh, 500 uh, big ships uh, with an army of 60,000 people, basically to take over the country and to kill or, or to enslave all the Greeks. And how the Greeks actually, they were able to, um, to defend themselves uh, with very few resources. And they thought um, how to repel actually the invasion because they knew uh, uh, that the invasion was in preparation uh, because they have colonies in, um, in the Mediterranean. So they knew that uh, the Persians were building ships uh, to attack them. So what did they do? They discussed very democratically. They have these um, this, uh, ancient uh, also assemblies where the people could actually discuss their ideas. So they discussed almost for a week and in the end, uh, they came to the conclusion that uh, they have no chance if they have to fight uh, one, one to one. So their mm -hmm. only chance was to actually to concentrate all the resources uh, to attack the, the Persians before they could actually set foot on, uh, on the Greek land. So they built very quickly very small ships. They built uh, 200 small ships. They waited for the Persians until they were close to the, to the coast. And then they, they actually sink all the Persian ships one by one by crashing into them. 
and uh, they built uh, these very very powerful um, uh, small ships uh, where 200 people were actually um, using oars just to to propulse the ships because they didn't have money to build uh, to buy sails. So they used this system and they actually crashed against the they rammed the Persian ships and they sink they sink one by one. Um, so after uh, only one day of battle, they destroyed completely the Persian army. And this is a fantastic example of uh, very, very wise use of resources because the Greek didn't have money, they didn't have savings, they didn't have a lot of resources, but they were able to actually to destroy the Persian army within one day uh, just by concentrated, uh, concentrating their, their efforts on one point. So using the resources wisely is something that can help us do what we need to do. And I think one of the things that I get from this is that what we can do is not only use resources, but to think outside of the box, to use the resources maybe a bit different. And so that we're not doing the same thing because, you know, same thing is going to equal the same response, you know, no matter you know, how we're working it. So um, one of the uh, chapters that kind of caught my attention is uh, the one on, or at least entitled, The Principles Are More Reliable Than Beliefs. And uh, caught my attention for a number of reasons. And um, for me, it's one of my favorite. But can you explain a little bit what you mean by principles are more reliable than beliefs? Yes. Uh, this was uh, super important uh, in Greek history because they have so many uh, different gods. I mean, when nowadays uh, we live in a Christian, uh, basically Christian uh, environment in Western Europe and the United States, and we have to deal with different um, uh, denominations, but more or less they are all uh, within the Christian uh, framework. But this was not the case in ancient Greece. In ancient Greece, uh, people were um, having different gods, whether it was Apollo, Minerva, uh, Athena. So they have um, different uh, gods and they have different ideas. But when it came to taking decisions, uh, the Greeks were extremely rational. So they mm -hmm. discussed uh, the different ideas, they discussed uh, the different points of view. Uh, sometimes they discussed their different uh, religious uh, ideas. But in the end, they tried to think very logically and try to, to define the principles um, that uh, allow them to make uh, good decisions. And when you see, for instance, um, when you read Hippocrates, huh, because uh, a good part of the book is based on Hippocrates' uh, uh, medical writings, when you see Hippocrates, how he actually made prescriptions, how he, he actually analyzed um, uh, medical problems, he was really very clear. I mean, uh, he came uh, to the same logic as we have today, going from the diagnosis to the treatment. But uh, he always maintained the principles and said, look, if you make the right diagnosis, um, you have to continue the treatment, even if it's not working the short term, because if the principle is correct, eventually you will get uh, the right result. And with this logic of maintaining the principle, even if it was not uh, working the short time, he actually uh, achieved uh, many healings and many uh, medical solutions that uh, in his time, people thought they were miracles. But this is just because he identified the principles uh, through observation, and then he continued applying the principles until they actually worked. And one of the problems uh, nowadays is that uh, I think people give up too quickly when they don't see immediate results. And you have to realize that uh, the, if the principles are correct, eventually they will work. So that seems very countercultural or even counterintuitive in, in the sense that for like the example you gave with the medications, if I'm giving somebody the certain medication, it's not working as well, but we're going to keep the course. We're going to keep doing what we're doing because the logic says that that should work. That That's so like counter what I think most of us are doing it is is that part of why society is in the mess it is in, do you think? Well, um, uh, let me come back to that, because it was not, I mean, when Hippocrates uh, made the prescription, um, 
it was usually not based on logic. It was based on observation. And this, this, is, this is the last chapter of my book saying that uh, the Greeks were very flexible when they came to principles because in the end they always came to the facts. And when they have discussion, they always argued on the base of, in the basis of facts. So if they saw that uh, when Hippocrates identified the pattern, because most medical uh, solutions are based on identification of patterns, when he identified the pattern that when you do this, then this happens, and when you do this, this happens, and he saw this pattern um, really come back repeatedly over and over again, eventually he was able to, uh, to, made, to make prescriptions very, very confidently and to say to people, look, this is the right principle. I have seen this uh, operating in reality hundreds of times. If you do this, you will, you will get well. And this is why when the, when the um, uh, ancient Greek people, they were sick, they went to the temple of Apollo, and they actually they asked for, a, for an oracle. They asked for, a, for an advice, for a recommendation um, to be actually healed. And they heard uh, from people who were experienced uh, physicians in the end, they said, look, this is the principle. You have to change your lifestyle. You have to do this, and then it will work. And then people put it into practice. And if they, if they actually uh, follow the advice, eventually it worked. So I think it's very important uh, to follow this logic because uh, when you see something happening once, twice, all the time, uh, you have to realize that it's an established principle and it's not very wise to try to go against it. Right. I think in a, a lot of ways in what you're saying is, is what's translating into our general society as to where we have seemed to gone so far astray from, you know, these principles to how we're living today. Does, does that seem fair or is there more to it? Well, to a certain extent, um, it is true. Um the problem is, is compounded because uh, we have more choices. And in ancient uh, Greek society, uh, the patterns of behavior were well established. And nowadays, um, if you live in an industrialized country, which is a wealthy country with many opportunities, um, sometimes it's not so easy to see the patterns because there are so many choices. And let me just give you an example. In mm -hmm. ancient uh, Greek society, um, there were clear expectations of uh, what to do. I mean, even if you were wealthy from a wealthy family, you still were expected to learn the profession. You still were expected uh, to spend uh, 10 years uh, building a business or building a career or whether it's agriculture, whether it was um, uh, shipping, whether it was uh, um, exporting olive oil. I mean, the business they had in ancient Greece. I mean, people really spent uh, their lifetime uh, building, a buildings, building a business or building a skill. And sometimes you see people like Demosthenes, who was a great um, public speaker. I mean, he spent 10 years uh, basically learning to speak. And, laying, and then he made a good living uh, writing uh, speeches for, the, for litigation. Mm -hmm. But this, this, this perspective and this expectation of having to put the time and having to put the effort uh, to develop your skills, it was present in ancient Greece from the first moment. And sometimes uh, when you live in an industrialized country, you lose this perspective because you don't realize that uh, you have to, to have a, a good behavior, a good, um, uh, you have to put the effort because uh, if you don't do that, uh, you cannot expect uh, success. And that piece right there, that, that end piece of what you're saying about putting in that effort and seeing the success in a lot of the clients that I'm working with or even the students that I'm teaching, I, I'm seeing that piece lacking, at least in my portion of, of the United States, that it, it seems, you know, almost like things are owed me or I'm expecting, uh, you know, great results with very minimal effort and getting confused when that's not happening. Yes, um, this is something that uh, you have to learn from experience. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it takes uh, too long and people make um, really painful mistakes. But this is because our culture is really so, um, so open and we have so many choices 
And uh, unless you really try to, to, to organize your ideas and to have a good philosophy, it's very easy to go uh, down the wrong path to make mistake after mistake. And then you find yourself uh, a few days, a few years later, that um, with the, with the very very limited choices, because basically you have wasted uh, your time. That was not the case in ancient Greece. Um, the choices were more limited. Uh, people were expected to learn the skills, um, and this is something that uh, unfortunately um, nowadays is is more difficult to do. I mean, we have other advantages that uh, the ancient Greeks didn't have, but this particular one. Uh, really plays uh, a role. Another thing I want to really mention about ancient Greeks is that uh, it was a, a very much uh, non-violent society. I mean, because uh, when I'm doing now interviews in the media about my book and people say, oh, but the ancient Greeks, they were always fighting and they were always fighting each other and they were always uh, attacking uh, other countries. And this is complete, a complete misunderstanding because, hmm. of course, uh, ancient societies, they were, by our standards, they were quite violent in the sense that uh, from time to time they have wars with other countries. But uh, you have to realize that uh, a, a, a culture that uh, managed to survive 1,000 years, like the ancient Greeks, it did, they did so because most of the time they only, they only fought uh, defensive wars. I mean, the ancient Greeks were extremely nonviolent because their main interest was business. Their main interest was really to develop themselves, to have a nice life, to have a comfortable life, and to really enjoy life. They didn't, they didn't go around uh, conquering other countries. I mean, in ancient uh, Greek history, when you see, uh, for instance, the, the, stories, the story of uh, Alexander the Great, uh, who conquered uh, a big part of uh, Asia, I mean, he was completely an exception of um, uh, Greek history. I mean, he was, well, first he was not from Athens, he was from Macedonia, from northern uh, Greece, but he's a complete exception, a historical exception. I mean, the ancient Greeks, most of the time, their main interest was to build their business, to build their connections, to build their colonies around the Mediterranean and to be able to enjoy life. And this is why they managed to, um, to believe, uh, to, they managed to, to thrive for so many uh, centuries. I mean, a culture that is aggressive, that wants to conquer other cultures, uh, this is so expensive to do and so unproductive that in the long term it is unsustainable. And this is why most of the other uh, cultures in the Mediterranean, they disappeared. I mean, the Greeks uh, really thrived for 1,000 years, and you see the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, eventually they, they, they disappeared because mm -hmm. they were so aggressive, and this is so inefficient as a, as a, as a culture uh, that basically you cannot survive. You cannot spend just all your resources uh, trying to build uh, uh, aggressiveness. This is, doesn't work. Which... As you were just saying that, what, what clicked in my mind, and let me know if I'm totally way off base, but when I take it from what you were just saying and placing it into uh, an individual, that it almost sounds to me that what the Greeks were doing is like taking care of themselves, you know, doing self-care and making sure that I have the resources and, and the talents that I need and that I'm strong, not physically, but, you know, have that ability to then interact with others, but I'm taking care of myself, I'm doing my self-care so that I can respond to others when necessary. Yes, that's a very good uh, summary, because um, the idea of having a huge army uh, attacking other countries, uh, like in the, in the times of Alexander the Great, uh, that was complete anathema to uh, to the ancient Greek mind. I mean, they, their priority was basically to, they have these uh, theater festivals, they have the Olympic Games, they have uh, good wine and olive oil, and they had good food. And this is, this is really what made the Greeks uh, very successful. And this is why so many other cultures, they wanted to trade with them, because uh, they have a lot to offer. I mean, when you have uh, this historical exception of uh, Alexander the Great, who actually attacked uh, Mesopotamia, they attacked uh, Persia, then he attacked uh, India. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't build anything because uh, when he died, he died quite young. When he died, everything collapsed immediately because there, there was nothing behind. So there is a, an important lesson to learn that uh, it is much better to try to, to focus on building your own life, to develop your skills, to develop uh, your network. This is much better to do that than to try to be aggressive.
and especially for uh, for young people, sometimes they, they they watch these movies that are extremely violent. But you have to realize it's just a movie. I mean, in real life, it doesn't work. Yes, and that whole thing then, if I'm taking care of myself and I'm not going out trying to conquer other people, but I'm also not being isolationist. So, you know, they, as you said, wanted to trade with others and interact with others, and that would probably go a long way in our societies of looking at then what are my you know, how do I take care of myself so that I can interact in a healthy way with other people? And then in that sense, we all benefit from what each of us is doing. Yes. And another principle I just want to mention about uh, ancient Greeks, which is um, also fascinating, is the principle of um, dividing risk and diversification. And this is something that um, sometimes we forget in our, uh, in our current time. But the Greeks, uh, they managed to survive for so many years and so many centuries because they diversified their assets. And uh, they built uh, this network of colonies. They built trade. They built uh, culture. They built uh, art. Uh, and they did it in a way that really diversified the risk. I mean, they didn't put all their eggs in one, in one basket. They really spread their bets. And they built um, a very, very large uh, mining business in, uh, in, um, in central Greece. They built uh, a very, very large um, manufacturing of uh, papyrus, of uh, paper, ancient paper in Egypt. So they built different businesses and different skills in different areas. And when you read Plato, uh, he tells the story of uh, Atlantis, which is, uh, I mean, you have seen uh, probably many movies about Atlantis and the myth of right. Atlantis, that uh, this uh, fantastic civilization that apparently existed. Um, um, and Plato really explains uh, how Atlantis disappeared. And this is very interesting because he compared uh, Atlantis with uh, Greece. And he said, look, the people in Atlantis, they were very tall. They were very intelligent. They were very, very much uh, powerful and, and strong. And they, they really wanted to conquer the whole uh, world. But the problem with Atlantis is that uh, it was an island. So they live all together in this island it was a very large island, and they built uh, this great civilization. But then um, one day, um, the level of, uh, of the sea, the, the water level, started to rise. So actually, mm -hmm. it was only a few, um, a few meters, but then it, it, it destroyed completely the Atlantis uh, civilization because people were not able to escape the island. And then uh, Plato compares uh, Atlantis with Greece and says, look, this could never happen in Greece because in Greece, we spread the risk all over the place and even if we have a problem in one city or a problem in one area, we can always go back. We can always fall back on the colonies. We can always fall back on the network. And this is a very important lesson that uh, you really want to have a, a smooth life, a stable life, a very solid, um, grounded life. It is much better to diversify the risk and to create a network and to have a balanced life. It is much better than um, concentrating all your efforts on just one thing, because if this one thing fails, uh, you might be wiped out like it happened to Atlantis. The, and yeah, and that's a, a great way of looking at that and in, in that diversity. And um, that that's what I, I also see as, as lacking nowadays is, at least in individuals, so many people want to become experts in a particular area. And I, I think in losing some of a more of like a, a liberal arts education in the sense of, you know, I, I know a little bit about a lot of things. Um, I think over the long run, we're stifling uh, some of the uh, either learning that can come out of it or the arts or uh, inventions um, by doing, you know, just the, the one thing. And uh, I know it's not exactly what, uh, you know, Plato was saying and what you are, but, you know, and that, that's kind of my take when we put it into the education mode. Yes, uh, indeed, um, diversification and uh, developing multiple skills is uh, really crucial because it ensures uh, longevity and uh, you will be able to actually uh, get work and to develop a career in different areas if you know to do uh, different things. And this is why the ancient uh, Greek education 
uh, which is another point that I cover in the book. Uh, it was very much uh, trying to build uh, the personality and trying to build the general skills of the person. I mean, they, they learned to read, they learned uh, grammar, they learned uh, how to speak, they learned how, how to write. And basically then uh, they try to develop at the same time their, their skills as a, as, a, uh, as a warrior, as a gymnastics. I mean, they tried to have a very much uh, holistic uh, approach to education. And it was not really focused on one specific skill. Uh, it was really focused on developing the whole personality so that in the end they built uh, good people. And this is the main purpose of education. If you just try to learn uh, practical skills and you have to, play, it's like learning little hacks, in the end, uh, you lose the whole picture. And mm-hmm. this is why the, the Greeks were so successful uh, also in ethics, because they were able to transmit uh, these values to their people uh, through legends, uh, through histories, uh, through myths. And this made the culture very, very much compact and very much resilient uh, when they have to face uh, adversity from time to time. Right. So I, I think in, you know, a lot of where we've talked does show that what the Greeks went through and what they learned, we can definitely take with us. Um, you know, when I first looked at, at the book, one of my thoughts was, you know, well, yeah, I, I can see this academically, but where does this fit anything? But going through the book and and speaking uh, with you now, there there's a definite uh, translation between what they were able to accomplish and what we can do, and you know thrive more so and in I, I think a healthier way than what's happening in the world now. And and I do see a, a very direct correlation. Yes, and just, I just want to mention one um, story um, about the war of uh, Athens against Sparta. And there is a very fascinating uh, book uh, written by Thucydides, uh, who died in uh, 400 BC. And Thucydides actually um, was living in Athens uh, when, they, when the Athenians lost the war. And he wrote a very long book trying to analyze the reasons for the war and why why it happened? Because um, it was completely devastating for uh, for ancient Greece. Actually, it was the end of the ancient um, classical Greece because after that, uh, actually never recovered. It went mm-hmm. on for a few hundred years, but the war was devastating. And to see this, when he analyzes uh, the war, uh, he gives us some uh, insights that are very, very, very useful still today. Because he went uh, through the specific uh, reasons for the war, and the end, he came up with the conclusion that actually the war was completely useless. I mean, people just became extremely emotional uh, because there were some misunderstandings. They started to become a bit also racist uh, against uh, the other peoples, against the Spartans, and the Spartans against the Athenians. Um, then there were some uh, incidents because there were some uh, really aggressive uh, individuals. And they started uh, skirmishes here and there, were really very small things. But then it, the whole thing was completely blown out of proportion uh, because people became completely hysterical. They started to, um, to really exterminate uh, children and women of uh, different uh, villages. And then the, the war broke out and it was complete devastation for the Athenians and for the Spartans. And when Thucydides came, um, came back to the, to the events and said, Why, how could this possibly happen? I mean, we have been living here for hundreds of years. How could people become so extremely rational? And he came um, uh, to the conclusion that um, human beings are prone um, to panic. We are prone to irrationality. And the only way to avoid this kind of catastrophes where people become completely hysterical, completely uh, aggressive is to take a step back and to try to keep uh, the problems in the right proportion. And this is um, something that could be said about every war, because in the end, uh, what happens is that uh, relatively small things become blown out of proportion. Uh, mm-hmm. People become completely hysterical and completely aggressive, and they start um, uh, really um, agitating in favor of war. And this is, this is what has caused distraction in many periods of history. So the lesson already was learned in ancient Greece. Uh, it's a pity that we see that sometimes it is repeated uh, over and over again, the same mistakes, and people become still uh, very, very emotional. 
by taking things uh, completely out of uh, context. Yeah, and I totally agree. And, and I think we're seeing that even in areas where we're not necessarily at war, but I, I think around uh, the world and in various uh, nations, what we're seeing is some of that emotional response to situations and peoples versus, you know, sitting back and, and really examining and studying, you know, more logically, scientifically, economically, all, all of those studies to really put that into place more so than uh, just spouting emotions and, you know, what everybody feels instead of, well, what is happening and what can we do about it? So I... I agree with all the wars, but I, I also kind of see it now. Yeah, the, the ancient Greeks, they had also their bad periods. I mean, there was a period of uh, public disorders in, uh, in the 7th century uh, where people started to fight on the street. It just, I mean, it just was a few skirmishes. But then um, they have elections. And this is fascinating uh, to see that um, uh, a bit uh, the story repeats itself because uh, they voted uh, for Draco. Uh, who they made him ruler of Athens. And Draco, I mean, you know the word uh, draconian comes from Draco because Draco uh, really took extreme measures uh, to avoid the public disorders. And basically he put um, the death penalty for everything. I mean, you had um, uh, a theft or you have a small discussion or a small injury, everything uh, went along with it with the death penalty. And mm -hmm. Draco... Um, was able to actually to placate uh, the public disorders for a, few, for a few years. But after three or four years, people were so fed up with the complete uh, apparatus of uh, dictatorship uh, that Draco created that they voted him out of office. And then they came back to the old system because they thought it much better to have uh, freedom and to have uh, um, uh, prudence and to have moderation. It is much better than to take extreme measures that in the end, uh, everybody's going to suffer because uh, they will quickly uh, deteriorate into a dictatorship. Yeah. Well, and, and for many reasons, but, you know, I think for this reason in particular, I'm, I'm very grateful for the books that you have written, and especially in uh, these last two, because I, I agree with you that I, I don't think many people spend the time to learn from history. And you're really out there encouraging people to, you know, learn from the history and apply the positives of what others have done throughout history in that effort, you know, not to repeat it. And uh, so I, I really enjoy uh, the fact that you're out there, that you're writing these books and really hope that people can take those to heart and see what changes can be made. Yes, um, indeed, uh, one of the frustrations uh, that um, I share, I think, with many authors is that nowadays uh, it is so easy and so inexpensive uh, to improve yourself and to learn and to develop new skills. But unfortunately, the resources are there, but people just don't use it. Uh, they right. use um, the, the, the time that is available and the resources that are available basically um, I don't know, for entertainment or for, um, uh, I don't know, for, for things that don't have a lot of, uh, don't add a lot of value. And we, we live in a period of history, which is extraordinary because you can learn anything very inexpensively and very, very quickly. And you can really develop your skills and develop uh, uh, yourself as a person uh, very, very um, continuously and at very low cost. But uh, it's a pity that uh, not so many people uh, take advantage of that. Too few. That, that's that's been my uh, estimation on, on what's going on. I, I totally agree with you know what you're saying on that. Um, as we're kind of uh, getting into the wrap up phase of this, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think is uh, really important that you want us to know either about the book or about something with, with the Greeks, or have we kind of covered the uh, basics of, of you know what? they were about and what you're trying to get across in your book? Yes, I just want to mention one idea that I think is uh, also super um, uh, important is that the, the approach uh, that the Asian Greek uh, had um, towards um, uh, peace of mind. And this is something which is surprising 
because it has been uh, misrepresented so often in, um, in history. And uh, when people t uh, talk about ancient Greek philosophy, sometimes they say, oh, well, you know, the Greeks they were, uh, they have this uh, stoic philosophy and they were really uh, very passive. And uh, this is complete uh, misrepresentation. Because when you see, uh, and when you actually read um, the ancient Greek authors, and you read, for instance, Sino, who was one of the first uh, Stoics, I mean, the way we use the word um, Stoicism nowadays is very much distorted. Because when you go to the, to the meaning that uh, the ancient Greeks uh, gave to these doctrines, basically they said, look, uh, you want to have peace of mind in life, uh, you don't have to be passive. You get peace of mind after you really take action and you really start the process um, to improve your situation, to solve your problems, you have to take the steps. And it's only after you actually take action that you gain peace of mind. So the ancient um, Stoics, they were very much following the course of nature, but not passively. The idea of passivity as a, as a, as a philosophical um, doctrine is very much modern, uh, and it was completely unknown to the ancient Greeks. I mean, the ancient Greeks mm. were always very much proactive, very much uh, taking initiative, and when they actually um, uh, discussed these doctrines, the uh, Stoicism, for instance, they actually meant the, the attainment of uh, peace of mind after you have taken action. And it is action that really delivers uh, self-confidence and serenity. I mean, you don't get uh, peace of mind just by sitting around and doing nothing. Right. And, and that's really interesting because I think a lot of people have that, uh, you know, misunderstood. So that, that's a really good distinction to make on there. Um, I know your book is on Amazon. Is that the best place for people to find the book? And uh, also, how can people connect with you if they have any other questions or want to learn more? Well, it's very easy to find. Uh, well, the books are in Amazon. They're in Barnes & Noble. They are also in the Kindle, so they can be um, easily found. But uh, you can also see my, uh, my blog. Uh, there are thousands, uh, well, at least hundreds. I think uh, already a couple of thousand articles published uh, through these years, but at least hundreds. And they are available uh, free of charge on my blog. So you, if you type uh, John Vespasian on Google, uh, you will find my blog and at least there are a few hundred uh, articles uh, there. Excellent. I, I really appreciate the time that you take to speak with me. And, you know, again, this is our second, uh, you know, talk. And, and I, I really learn a lot by looking at the past and with the history. Uh, so I, I'm definitely looking forward if there's a book nine on the way, maybe. Yes, it is. Um, it will be published this year in 2017. Um, unfortunately, I cannot write as fast as I would like. It, it, now it takes me a year to write a book. Maybe this time will be a bit shorter, but uh, it's just the time it takes. I, I, I cannot do it any faster. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely then something to look forward to that there's another one coming out. And uh, again, I, I really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to hopefully speaking with you again when the next book is out. Many thanks, uh, Chris. It was a pleasure to talk to you. All right. Well, you have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.